afternoon, Berlin. How you doing? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. I know that post lunch thing. I get it. I get it. I always get the big room too. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, tiered tragedy, a quick peek into failure, and the presentation is going to focus around a specific incident that we had at my company and how we went about not only just troubleshooting it, but then going through that post-mortem process and understanding what we can do to make the teams, especially the developers, a bit more effective in the process. So I've got uh, a little bit of good news and a little bit of bad news. The good news is that this probably won't go the full 40 minutes. The bad news is, uh, you know how you go to conferences and they talk about how everything's going great and everything is perfect and they're gonna instill all this great knowledge on you? Yeah, that's not this talk. Um, this talk is gonna air a lot of dirty laundry. Uh, the idea though is to generate a conversation, to be open and honest about the sorts of failures that we got because everyone knows you know, how perfect the unicorns are, but it's sometimes refreshing to hear that other companies are struggling with some of the same problems that you're having. Uh, so while I offer some solutions, hopefully it starts a conversation where we can figure out the other pieces together. So first, I'll give you a quick high-level overview of what actually went wrong. So uh, we were doing a deployment, and it was a standard run-of-the-mill deployment. Uh, we're a rail shop, so we run Ruby on Rails. And the engineer that was doing the deploy ran the database migrations. And he's waiting, he's waiting, he's waiting, and then he says, this is taking longer than it should. But he didn't know what to do. So he paged out to my team, the tech ops team. So the tech ops team gets the page, and they start investigating things, and they're noticing some weirdness in the database, but nothing jumps out immediately. Then suddenly, all the alarms go off, saying that the web nodes are at capacity. Then we get another alarm saying the site's down. So now we're, people are frantically switching over to the web tier, trying to figure out what's going on with the web tier. After they start figuring out what's happening at the web tier, they realize, oh, it actually is related to the database problem. Let's start looking into the database problem. Turns out there was a lot of heavy database locking that was going on, and there was a migration that was running that was blocking subsequent requests from going through the system. So after diagnosing that, they killed the query that was blocking all of the requests, restarted the web nodes, life was good. Seemed like a fairly basic thing, but as we went through the process and as we started digging deeper, we realized that there were some really systemic issues with not just the uh, system, but uh, how we go about managing these deployments. So we're gonna dig into that quite a bit. So first, because this is a 100 level uh, talk, I wanted to go through and, and make sure we level set on some of the terms that I'll probably be using, uh, specifically talking around systems. So when we talk about systems, people have you know, different ideas depending on the scope that they're talking about. Sometimes they're talking about you know, the little application that they use. Sometimes they're talking about uh, a specific server. But when I'm talking about systems, what I'm talking about is like this sort of definition, a set of connected things or parts forming a complex whole. A subsystem is a set of elements which is a system itself and a component, in a component of larger systems. So the perfect example that I always think of that is databases. Databases are these very complex pieces of software. And if any of you have ever dove into database technology, you understand and realize just how many like moving parts there are. But if you're up in abstraction level, it's really just this thing you dump data into. And you don't really need to understand the abstraction until you do, right? And then when you do need to understand it, it's probably too late and you've already screwed yourself, but you're gonna do a lot of learning really quickly. So that's an example of like a subsystem that's part of this larger system. And then failure modes are the particular way in which a system degrades or ultimately fails to perform as intended or designed. So we had a couple different failure modes in this particular incident where the system started to slow down, then the system stopped accepting new queries, then the system sort of collapsed altogether. So with that, I'll actually introduce myself now that I've set you up, hopefully you're leaning in a little bit more. My name is Jeff Smith. I'm the director of production operations at a company called Centro in Chicago, back in the States. Uh, Centro is a media services company. Well, let me back up. First, director of production operations. My team handles all of the infrastructure for our basis platform solution. We run a software as a service solution, and my team handles not just production, but we also handle all of the staging environments, all of the CI CD environments, and soon even local development environments so that we can ensure that what people are running on their local workstations actually mimics what's running in staging and production. Um, 
This is the slide where I would sell you on Centro and let you know that we're hiring. I'm guessing none of you are relocating to the US, at least not until after the 2020 election. Um, and then even then, I might be asking you for a job, so uh, we'll just go ahead and skip that part until uh, the politics thing works out. <laughs> so now we'll, we'll walk through that failure in a little bit more detail, just so that everyone can kind of understand the process that we went through and all the issues that we ran into. So, uh, this is our basic architecture. It's nothing fancy, right? We're in AWS. Uh, we've got an elastic load balancer. Actually, it's an ALB now. Set of web servers. We use Postgres for our database backend. Um, we use RabbitMQ for message processing, for message queuing. And for our worker nodes that do background processing, uh, we use Sidekick. For those not familiar with the Ruby community, Sidekick is a very standard batch processing, backend processing um, tool in that community. We also have a read-only slave, but that's not really gonna factor in too much here. So that's basic high-level architecture. So for our deployment process, we do blue-green deployments. For those unfamiliar with blue-green deployments, instead of deploying to existing nodes, new code, we basically bring up brand new nodes that have the new code on it, and then we simply switch our load balancer to point to the new set of servers. This occurs both for our web servers and our Sidekick servers. We are running a monolith. We are not running microservices because we don't hate ourselves yet. Um, but that's going to change because <laughs> everyone eventually hates themselves. Uh, but that happens both for the Sidekick nodes and on the web server nodes. So in our deployment process, what happened was uh, our deployment engineer ran the database migrations on these inactive set of nodes. And it turns out that the database migration was doing an alter table on this auth users table. Now, auth users is a fairly contentious table. Because ORMs are the devil, it gets accessed a lot more frequently than it probably should. So, that we, so we sort of know that any sort of deployment around this table can be potentially problematic. But in addition to that, the sidekick nodes were doing a lot of extra work that they typically don't do. And we didn't notice it when it originally kicked off. But basically, a user did an action that created these background tasks. And the background tasks typically run fairly fast. But this particular user had a specific use case that generated a lot of history. And that history resulted in this usually quick query exploding into this extremely long-running transaction. And the long-running transactions is sort of the linchpin, if there is one, in this particular failure. So before I dig into it, a quick primer on Postgres locking for those that are unfamiliar at the database level. So in Postgres, every query generates a lock of some sort. Some lock types conflict with each other. If I'm just doing a select, I'll probably just grab an access share lock. And as long as everyone else can share with an access share lock, there's no problems, there's no conflicts. But there are conflicting locks that happen. So for example, with this auth user table, the alter table command needs an access exclusive lock. And that conflicts with the access share lock. Whenever you have a conflict, the query that's trying to the conflicting lock basically goes into a lock wait queue. And it stays there until the other locks are released and it can finally execute. Blocking conflicting locks, so in our case, the alter table, will block subsequent locks from actually grabbing their lock, even if it's only an access share lock. They all stack up behind it. Locks are held until the transaction that has them does a commit or rollback. So if you query a table at the beginning of your transaction and don't do anything with it until the end, you're still holding that lock until you either commit your transaction or until you roll it back. And that's a key point to this actual failure. So to sort of draw a picture, we've got these sidekick tasks that are running, these long running transactions we were talking about earlier. They each are grabbing an access share lock, but because they're not conflicting with each other, they all run concurrently, life is good. Then comes our alter table command. Now the alter table command needs an access exclusive lock. It can't get that though because these access share locks are going and they're continuously held because this transaction is long running. And when I say long, I'm talking like hours, four plus hours or something like that. So now the alter table command goes into the waiting and wait and lock queue. In normal operations, that's not the end of the world, right? But the problem is not only are these transactions long running, but we've also got these additional web requests. 
the additional web requests are coming in and they're trying to access auth users. They can't because the access exclusive is in the, wait, is in the lock queue. So they stack up behind, waiting to execute. And they stack and they stack and they stack and they stack. Now, on the web front end side, you've got the internet. Internet users are coming into the web nodes. The web nodes are making a request to Postgres. But that HTTP call is blocking forever. Why? <laughs> because we don't do timeouts. There's no timeouts. So they just block and block and block and block. Well, guess what? Those are blocking, but they're still accepting new connections, new transactions, right? So what happens? These HTTP requests keep stacking and stacking and stacking and stacking until it runs out of possible ports, port exhaustion, or you know, even a, a, a page, uh, an Apache front end queue or something to that effect. Bottom line is it's not accepting new requests. When it's not accepting new requests, guess what it can't answer to? The load balancer health check. So it makes a load balancer health check, and it says, oh, this thing's not responding. So the load balancer marks it off. Does that three, four, five times, eventually it runs out of web servers. Auto scaling doesn't fix this, why? Because it's gonna run into the exact same problem and we're just gonna pay more. Sort of a, a, a nightmare situation. So timeline of events. Migrations run, they're running longer than expected. Someone page tech ops, because the deploy team is stuck on figuring out what goes on. The web tier fires a bunch of alerts saying that we're running out of web capacity We've got heavy DB locking going on. Migrations can't make progress until we clear the blocking query. Sounds like we've got a pretty solid explanation, right? So how do we go about making improvements on this? Because the thing about failure is it's one of the best learning opportunities you have. How do you find out more about your system unless you start digging into the failures? So that's what we did. We started looking at it and we said, all right, brief recap. The alter table was a DDL statement on a very busy table. That's a bad thing. No, you don't do that. Yes, we should be able to do uh, zero downtime migrations. I know that. It's not news to us. We're just not there yet, organizationally. We just haven't got there yet. So we have all these other processes that we do to sort of manage these incidents. Long running transactions. Four plus hours of a transaction time is, is potentially dangerous. We gotta figure out how do we prevent that from happening. And then no DB timeouts at the, at the web tier. Every query should time out at some point. We shouldn't wait forever. So those are things that we can fix, right? Then we started looking at it from the ops side. What are the things that we missed? Possible alerts that could have given us uh, a little bit more clarity into what was going on. Maybe we alert on the long running transaction. It's a soft alert though, right? You can't page someone because what do they actually do with that information? Hey Jeff, wake up, wake up. There's a query running really long. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do I just kill it? No. So it's got to be a soft alert. So it's informational, right? So that might not have solved the problem, but at least you become aware of it. And in this particular situation, it might have helped because we would have gotten an email in the middle of the day saying, hey, this thing's been running four hours and everyone was available to actually talk about it. So maybe it would have helped. Database lock threshold. All of these queries held a lock for a very long time. Maybe we should be alerting on that. Maybe a, a, a lock should only be held for so long. But again, it's another one of those soft alerts, right? Do you wake up in the middle of the night and just start killing stuff in, the, in your sleep? It's probably not safe. Block queries. Alert when a, larger, a number of large queries are blocked, because that's usually a symptom of something. If you're seeing a lot, a lot of blocking going on, someone probably needs to know about that. And that's probably worth actually waking someone up if, if necessary, just because you know what that story looks like in the end. <laughs> you know eventually it's gonna end bad. But when we had this conversation and everyone was like, yeah, yeah, I think we know what happened. It makes perfect sense, let's go, case closed, let's get these fixes up. I said, wait a second, maybe we need to go a little bit deeper on this. Maybe there's other conversations or questions that we should have because there was one part of the system that we never really looked at. Can anyone think about what component of the system was missing? You. People, humans, processes, all the things that we do around incidents, around development, around commit techniques, all of this stuff is actually part of the system that we design, develop, and deploy. We're never really thinking about it in those terms, but when you have a failure happen, it really starts to highlight it once you start to dig in into what exactly went wrong, 
how it went wrong and what people were thinking when it went belly up. When you add operators to this, you think about all the different things that they have to interact with and know about. You have to think about, you know, they need information about the Postgres database. How are they getting feedback about those systems? How are they getting feedback about the system overall and how it's behaving? They need to know about the worker nodes. How long is each worker node running in a process? What sort of queue latency is happening? These are all metrics, data, and feedback that we have to think about in the design phase to make sure that we're getting the information necessary to the people that are gonna manage it. And it's not just tech ops folks, too, because as developers, you guys understand the system far better than I ever could. So how do you know that your process is actually working? The absence of errors doesn't mean that it's not working. Or, sorry, the absence of errors doesn't mean that it's working, right? It's just failing silently. So we have to think about these things in this process. And when we start doing postmortems on systems, a lot of times we're talking about the technical bits. But what about the human bits? Who's having that conversation? So that's what we did. We went back and we said, all right, let's focus on the human side of this same incident. So the first thing I noticed was when we talked about this, uh, the engineer that was doing the deployment had said, I noticed the migrations were running a long time. And I said, well, what does that mean? Like, what is a long time? How do you know that it was a long time? He said, well, I did the deploy in the staging environment, and it only took a second or two there. So it was going for more than a minute. I figured something was up. So that's the first thing we focused on. We said, well, what if you weren't the one that did the staging deployment? Or what if you weren't the one doing the production deployment? You have a bit of expertise that's sort of like siloed in you that we need to figure out how to get out for every deploy. And people looked at me like I was crazy. They were like, well, I mean, as long as he does the staging deploy, everyone's good, right? But like one day he might not be. One day he might walk out and get hit by a bus and now someone else has got to do the deploy. And if it weren't for him having done the staging deploy, how long would another engineer have waited before they realized there was a problem? Five minutes? 10 minutes? How long does an alter table run on a 5,000, 10,000 row table? Anybody know off the top of their head? It's right, because it's all subjective. Well, it depends how much activity is going on in the database. How big is the database server? Are you adding a default column, right? There's all these things that anyone with, with just basic information would not be able to gauge appropriately. So we tried to tackle this first. We said, all right, how do we codify this, get the expertise out of uh, this deployment engineer and into everyone's hands? So we use a chat bot for most of our uh, operational activities. And we did that specifically so that we could sort of democratize the operations of the systems. And one of the things we did was we said, all right, when we run migrations in a staging environment, we will now record how long the migrations ran so that when someone does that same migration in production, they get feedback immediately. So we see, oh, Carrie found one staging migration runtime for version 4.9.1.0. It ran 11 seconds on staging 02 at that date. So now, regardless of who does the deployment, next time they run a migration, they're going to look and they're, after 11 seconds, they're going to go, hmm, this is weird. After 30 seconds, they're going to say, all right, I probably should call someone. This is bad. So we were able to take that expertise that he had and just sort of democratize it. Because when you think about it, there's a lot of things in tech where the expertise is really about knowing what to look for, not necessarily how to get that information. We've got Google for that, right? But if we can take the information that we know how to get and make it available for people, people will begin to be, connect the dots themselves. But we focus so much on the training on how you get this data. Let's make it easy for them. Next question we had, why didn't we catch this in staging? An obvious question, right? We ran it in staging. Well, we don't have users in staging. <laughs> also, the sidekick job that was running in production, creating the long running transaction, was initiated by the user and was kind of an unusual case. It was a perfect storm. And this is something that we fail all the time on. We strive to say staging is like production. Staging will never be like production. You can put a lot of energy into it to make it look better, but you don't have those pesky things called users going around running crazy reports that are taking four or five hours each. But the problem is when we keep reiterating, staging is just like production, staging is just like production, guess what? People believe it. <laughs> they actually believe the shit you're talking. <laughs> well, I ran it in staging, so in, in staging is just like production, minus the users, the actual data changes, and you know, not refreshing it every other week. So we do ourselves a disservice when we constantly talk about staging being just like production. 
It's not, it never will be. And when you, when you accept that, you begin to think and program more defensively around those scenarios. You get rid of the crutch of, well, it worked in staging, so I can go to bed, because I know it's gonna be fine in production. Now you're thinking more defensively and you're saying, well, it worked in staging, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Why did we need to pay jobs? What is it that ops had that couldn't be fulfilled by the engineering team that was doing the deploy? Not that I don't mind, not that I mind getting paid, I'm not trying to skirt work, but my thing is I always want to make sure my developers are empowered to do and get the information that they need. So when they had to page me for this, I got curious and they said, nobody else has access to the DB at that layer. Plus we don't have the Postgres knowledge to find blocking queries. I wouldn't even know where to start finding that info. So the first bit, access to the DB at that layer, that's a thing, right? I'm pretty sure everyone works in a shop where they have different access controls for different reasons, probably because someone screwed something up seven years ago and no one remembers the story, but these things are real. So we went about trying to solve that through a read-only node, but that doesn't really help with things like locking because they still need to be able to actually see what's going on on the actual production server. But when they said, we don't have the Postgres knowledge to find blocking queries, guess what? Neither do I. <laughs> I have a really cool snippet of code in my notes app that I can copy and paste whenever I need to, but my real expertise is in knowing that I should be looking for blocking queries. But the development team knew that. They just didn't have the capability to do that. So what they're paging me for isn't really my expert opinion. It's really for my note app. So let's codify that. Let's take that and make it something that developers can get to themselves, even if they don't have the expertise. They know they need to look for blocking queries. So how do we make that accessible to them? We went back to Marvin and we said, Marvin, let's do a chat command. So then we created a query that says, let's lock queries for a particular environment. Marvin goes out and executes the notes app. So I'm now fireable. You don't need me anymore. And it tells us, well, this query is blocked. Here's the query that's blocking it. And here's long, how long that query has been running. And what's interesting about this particular snippet is this is an incident that we had after this one that I'm talking about today. And guess what? When it happened, the pattern looked very similar. Someone did a deploy. It was an altered table. Things took longer. The deploying engineer knew it took longer because he was getting feedback from Marvin saying, hey, I ran this in staging and it only took five seconds. So he says, hmm, let me look for block queries. Now he has the capability to do that. And he sees, oh, look, there's an altered table going on. That's bad. He was able to correct the issue. And yes, we still encountered the problem, but it wasn't catastrophic. There was no outage. We just stopped it, figured out that there was a long running transaction, killed that transaction and redid the deployment. So we have to think about how do we react to failure? How do we react to incidences versus just strictly trying to prevent them? Because there's every, every time you guys commit new code, you're introducing a new failure mode scenario. Every time. Doesn't matter how simple it is. I once had a failure from a logo change. And of course, everyone's like, there's no way. All we did was update a logo. Well, you know, there was some weird dependency or something where something didn't get deployed with the rest of the package. So every time you deploy code, you're introducing a new failure mode. So the idea that you're gonna prevent failure is insane. All you can do is prepare for how you react to it. Why wasn't this flagged for a maintenance release? Again, auth users isn't anything new to us. We're familiar with this. We know that it causes problems. So why didn't we do a maintenance release where we take the application down, run the migration, bring it back up? We've got very forgiving customers at this stage of the game. So if we do a release at 10.30 in the evening, nobody knows, nobody cares. Those times are coming to an end, but for now, we're gonna milk it for all it's worth. The response was, this was the developer's first time really working in the platform. He wasn't aware of the history or the access contention around this table, and it went smoothly in staging. So there goes staging again, screwing us, right? That fake security blanket. But when they said this was the developer's first time, I said, well, this is interesting because the developer that did this, I know and I have a lot of respect for. He's a really sharp person. So if he didn't know, I'm guessing a lot of other people don't know. So I said, what is the mechanism where a developer gets this information? 
Is it infused in them during the, the onboarding process? Well, if you ever mess with alt users, you know, you need to take the system down. Oh, and here's your HR benefit information. It's probably not how the conversation goes. So I asked, I was like, well, how would they know? Is there a Confluence page? If there is, that doesn't help because Confluence sucks. So, <laughs> so how do you find out this stuff? <laughs> so we went around asking and they said, well, you know, actually there's a, there is a process for this. There is a uh, uh, application that we use in Bitbucket called WorkZone. Anyone familiar with it? WorkZone allows you to say, if a file changes of this pattern, add these people to the pull requests. So, yeah, helpful, right? Um, <laughs> so Josh and Ken are some of our senior folks, and they're like, whenever there's a DB migration, we get added to the pull request. So we asked them, and they're like, I don't remember seeing this. Like, really, you don't? No, I would have noticed. I would have freaked out. I didn't see this. So we look, and guess what? Work zone was disabled. We dig into that. <laughs> Turns out that there was a hot fix a week or two ago, and the two gatekeepers weren't available to approve the PR. So the stash admin just disabled PR approvers so that we could get the damn thing out and fix our problem. But he forgot to turn it back on. So now our gatekeeper process directly contributed to our failure mode, right? But this is something that would never come up in a Datadog dashboard. So we got burned by our gatekeeping process that was supposed to make us more secure, more resilient. So gatekeeping isn't always the answer. But then my favorite, what was the reason for the change? Why were we doing this in the first place? And they said, well, the change was part of an enhancement to force password expiration. It's part of our larger security hardening effort. And I applaud security hardening efforts. I had been begging for it because we were talking about going for our SOC 2 compliance. The problem is, when I asked for it and suggested it, I thought I would be involved in the process, but I wasn't. Because had I been involved with the process, I probably would have told them that NIST said in 2017, password expiration is no longer a best practice. <laughs> right from the NIST guidelines, verifiers should not require memorized secrets to be changed arbitrarily, arbitrarily periodically. However, verifiers shall force a change if there is evidence of a compromise of the authenticator. That's from NIST. And that's from whatever other UK government standard is that has basically the same language. So, the thing that brought us down was all inspired by something we didn't even need. A change that wasn't needed was missed by a review process that was disabled for a change that couldn't be simulated in staging that interacted poorly with a user action which led to a system failure. Is this a technical failure? Is it a process failure? Or is it a system failure? It's everything. Because none of these, if we took one of these incidents and had it happen in a vacuum, it probably isn't gonna be an issue. And it's definitely not gonna be a system outage. But when you have all of these complex interactions happening, catastrophe occurs. And there's no value, that's the other thing, this feature, gave us zero value. The only value we got out of it was this talk and a free trip to Berlin. <laughs> right? <laughs> Other than that, <laughs> there was really no useful thing that came out of this. And it sounds like this might be a one-off case, but I guarantee you I've done a bunch of these and it happens in every single one. Every single one, when I have conversations at a deeper level, when I ask questions about what were you thinking, what was your mindset in this scenario, there are always different views that people have on how the system acts, how it behaves. Even something as simple as, well, Bob ran the wrong command. Well, that's funny. Are the commands so similar that Bob could get the two confused? Maybe that's your problem. Is it a command that also, that lists database actions and then with the wrong flask also drops the database? Might be a bad design, right? Oh shit, man, I was trying to list the database tables and I accidentally deleted it. Those are sentences and conversations that should never happen. So, what were the real lessons learned? What did we really get out of this? We got a handful of things out of it. The first thing, if you're still doing root cause analysis, please stop. There is no one cause. There's always multiple, multiple layers to this. Work in a vacuum. You gotta make sure that you talk with all the stakeholders. 
And that's where product ownership comes in, product management. Use automation to free expertise. Think about the things that are sort of tribal knowledge in terms of how people do things and get that in the code. Because the reality is people really don't even need to know specifically how to do a thing, they just need to be able to get that information. A perfect example is um, our Kubernetes migration, right? There are a small group of people that really care about what the specific kubectl commands our automation is executing. So we still have the automation, we just echo the command for those four people. Yeah, listen, this is what we executed, right? But the majority of people don't care. They just want to be able to accomplish a task. Staging is not production. Staging is not production. It will never be like production. Stop it. Don't care how much energy you put into it. It'll be better, but it's not production. And the more we keep repeating that, the more we keep talking about it, the more dangerous we're making it because people believe it. And then humans are part of the system. Our processes, our people, the administration work that we do, they all have technical impacts. So you can't divorce that from your technical retrospectives or postmortems or after, what are we calling them this week? There was another term I heard, after action report, something like that. Whatever it is, make sure that the human component is part of that because it's so crucial to the lessons learned. But another interesting thing is that uptime and stability are a feature. They don't come for free. And this is something that you have to remind your product teams of, depending on your organization. At Centro, our product team is relatively strong, and they really have a grasp on what it is the developers work on. They really set the, the tone. But the thing is, until they're partially responsible for some of the uptime, that work doesn't get prioritized. It's like, oh, web timeouts. Yeah, that's cool and all, but what we really need is this new TPS report. So if you could go ahead and work on that, and then I'll figure out prioritizing web timeouts. Now, if the product manager is the one getting pulled into the office, because we were down, he was like, shit, guys, we need to do web timeouts now. I don't even know what it means, but we need to implement it ASAP. So getting product on board with some of these changes is hugely impactful, but then also putting skin in the game. We've sort of moved this ball already, right? DevOps put it so that dev and ops shared operational responsibility, but guess what? If dev isn't in charge of prioritizing all of their work, then the people that are in charge of prioritizing it need some skin in the game as well. Oh, that's it, sweet. Uh, yeah, I just sort of crash landed there, sorry. Well, thank you. Uh,